All right, hey everyone. I wanted to record this video because I found out a lot of new interesting clues in this, you know, search for what's going on with GME, specifically with regards to the ETFs. Um, there seems to be a lot of weird stuff going on, especially with XRT, but with several other ETFs as well. And a lot of the digging I've done into academic papers this last two days um, has revealed some things that um, I don't think, you know, we've seen before. Um, so I just want to, you know, put out this information. Um, if, if you have any comments or questions, put it in the description below. I'll try to answer as best as I can. And I'll also release this on Twitter um, to, to get some feedback. But I'll start, I'll start it now. I'll share my screen really quick. Um, here we go. So hopefully you should be able to see this. But um, we'll start off with, you know, the price today. It's been mostly flat. Um, we've been slightly trading upwards up to $25. Um, we still have a, a pretty decent gamma ramp built this week, expiring tomorrow, so we'll have to see what happens with that. But what I've really been focusing on, right, is this ETF question. Because as I've noted in my, my previous videos, right, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the short interest out of out of GameStop itself has has gone, right? GameStop is reportedly only at 25, you know, 26% short interest. And that's touted as a reason for why the stock squeezes over and why retail would be dumb for buying and holding um, and why, you know, potential price run ups in the future are impossible. But I think they've been using the ETFs and Turd Ferg actually, you know, he his DD greatly predates mine on this, um, ha has made the same hypothesis. So let's get into it. But to understand what's happening here, we need to get the basics first, right? So ETFs are basically baskets of stocks that are wrapped together into a single security and sold. And you know, as this you know little um, this little blurb from from Bloomberg mentions or from BlackRock, excuse me, mentions right. Like this used to be solely a one trillion dollar um, AUM business, and now it's fourteen and a half trillion. Um, and so it's it's absolutely ballooned. And the key thing to note with an, with an ETF is there's an institution called an AP, an authorized participant. And the authorized participant is responsible for creating and redeeming the ETF basket into its constituent elements. So that can be shares, that can be bonds, that can be other exotic products, right? That could even be options, right? That can be uh, VIX, VIX futures, that there's a VIX ETF. Um, but these institutions, which are mainly brokers and banks, work to create uh, shares or um, or buy shares or sell shares into the market whenever an uh, ETF share is redeemed or is created, right? So, okay, so first of all, you know, let's designate the two types of markets, right? There's the, the primary market, which is literally going to the authorized participant and asking for an ETF share or going to them with an ETF share and saying, I want to redeem this for the basket of stocks. That's called the primary market. And the secondary market is what we all know as, you know, the normal listed price, the lit exchange markets, where the ETF is traded widely between, you know, participants. So like, let's say, you know, SPY, for example, SPY, the, the stock, or the, you know, the, the, the index is traded as SPX, there's also, you know, VU, there's, you know, there's tons of indexes that, that of other ETFs that, that cover uh, SPY as an index, right? And it's an ETF that just synthetically creates the index by buying all of the stocks in the index. And so, you know, these, these pooled investment vehicles, right? I'll, I'll zoom in here so you can see. Um, these pooled investment vehicles basically exist as a way for you know people to get exposure to a broad range of stocks and so you know this primary market where the institutions authorized participants are create eat or or destroy etf shares um those shares eventually make their way out into the real market where you know banks brokers hedge funds retail investors mutual funds buy and sell etf shares between each other and so you know the primary market like they say here is a lot less than the secondary market and that makes sense right not many everyone might buy or sell an etf share not many people actually ask for an issuance or redemption 
And these authorized participants are ma mainly banks. Now, um, the authorized participants have um, uh, an agreement with a market maker to to make the market to create, you know, to to find inventory for the for these shares, right? So if they want to create, you know, let's say they they want to create a share of of you know QQQ, the Nasdaq ETF. They would go to, you know, they have the right to create the actual ETF share, but they need the underlying shares that make up this ETF. So they would go to Citadel, they would go to, you know, Virtu, they go to some other market maker, and they would ask for the shares that make up this index. And they once they get the shares, you know, one of each or however the index is set up, they'd get the proportional amount of shares pro rata. And then they'd pack them into the ETF. So they're always the AP is always paired with a market maker, and of course, as you can imagine, the main market maker in the U.S. is Citadel. And so Citadel is at a central clearing role and a central um, sourcing role, uh, we should say, for um, you know, for ETF authorized participants, for the banks and the brokers that create these ETFs. And so they provide this two-sided buy and sell quotes to clients on the exchange, and they're liquidity providers in the ecosystem. And you know, once they create the share, they can go list it on the exchange and this ETF share, excuse me, and these ETF shares trade freely, right? And there's generally an arbitrage mechanism that exists, right, in the market for for ETFs because if you have a basket of stocks, like let's use you know the S&P 500 for example, if all the basket of stocks combined equals a certain value of like let's say you know. Here, the example of you know they give ninety nine dollars and a hundred. The underlying securities are ninety nine dollars, but the price of the ETF is is a hundred. You could, you know, you could go to the to the authorized participant. You could deliver them the underlying shares, get one share of the um, ETF, and sell the ETF because the ETF is trading at a hundred, whereas the underlying is trading at ninety nine. And you can do the inverse if these roles are reversed, right? If the market price of the ETF is 99, well, the value of the underlying securities is 100, you can take this share, you can go to the authorized participant, right? You can take the ETF share and you can redeem it for all the basket of underlying securities. You can sell all of them and get a $1 profit, right? And so this is called ETF arbitrage. And this is theoretically meant, right, to keep the price of the ETF in line with the market price of the securities that it uh, that it constitutes. So if um, you know if the price gets too if the price gets too out of whack, right? Traders, arbitragers will come in and use the this AP mechanism, this arbitrage mechanism, with the authorized participant to either create or redeem ETF shares, either you know creating or destroying supply in the process and rebalancing the price. Right, and so this is dynamic. Right, this will change all the time, and the ETFs are regulated differently than a single stock, and so they can they can issue uh, more or less shares as needed to deal with market conditions, and so you know here this we discuss this right. They can create this this new um, you know ETF share in three ways. They can deliver a creation basket or the pre a pre specified bundle of securities representing the underlying broke to the to the ETF issuer. You can also provide cash to the full or partial value of the creation basket. Or you can equal cash equal to the value of the ETF shares plus a trading sped to the issuer. Right? And so then the and in, in return the ETF issuer will it will deliver you the new shares of the ETF. And so when there are too many shares outstanding, right, um, an AP can buy their own shares and return them to the issuer. And um, essentially, right, get them um, get them redeemed and take advantage of that arbitrage. Okay, so we got the basics down of how this system works, how this creation redemption, how market makers work in the middle to facilitate trades. These authorized participants, which are mainly banks, broker dealers, right? They're the ones who create and redeem shares. And these exchanges work as you know the sourcing mechanism for the underlying. Okay, so the other day I found this paper and it was 
Um, I posted about it in a tweet. It went viral um, with like 700,000 views. People were really interested in what this meant. And I just stumbled across this when I was just doing some research on right the, the FTD cycles. Um, and what's interesting is that this paper is from a couple professors from the University of Brno, which is similar to Bruno, which was um, the character in Roaring Kitty's recent tweet who was looking at a screen with a green face and he's a character who can see the future. And so that, you know, that's pretty interesting. But, you know, tinfoil aside, right, this paper discusses how ETF um, failure to deliver cycles were evident as pretty strong um, indicators for GameStop price movements during 2021. And there was a lot of um, a lot of really key interesting points I wanted to I wanted to you know highlight in this paper. So the first thing is right, um, an FTD with an ETF is not the same as an FTD with a normal stock, right? So because they have a delivery requirement, the authorized participant and or the market maker in the stock market can legally delay delivery of shares for three additional trading days, referred to as T plus six, beyond the standard T plus three clearing time, thus lawfully creating extra FTDs. In other words, the AP has the option to sell short ETF shares and then fail to deliver them at the settlement date. Additionally, Rule 204 provides an extended period of up to 35 calendar days, referred to as T plus 35, to close out certain FTDs if an FTD position results from the sale of a security that a person is deemed to own and that such person intends to deliver as soon as all restrictions on delivery have been removed. And so essentially, right, they can delay, they can create ETF shares and they can delay actual deliver, you know, delivery of their shares for 35 trading days. And, you know, this has obviously been a key hole in the market, but it makes sense because a lot of the underlying shares are liquid, right? You may not be actually able to source the shares. And in a delayed settlement system like we have, if you want an ETF share now, right, and someone buys it, they are, you know, especially if, if it's a creation request or redemption request, they're legally obligated to do it. So what their solution is, they just, they create you, they create a share for you, but then they fail to deliver on, you know, the actual share, or they just don't even buy the underlying um, shares at all, which we'll get into in a little bit. But this hypothesis, right, um, you know, we talk about, talk about, you know, naked trading strategies that result in this pattern of systemic and recurring fails, flaw the principle and do not comply with reg show. Um, can these exceptions form you know, systematic cycles or are all these failures exceptional? And so what they do in this paper is they're trying to test, right, if the delivery, if, if the spikes in FTDs of the, of the ETFs are similar to the prices, to the spikes in GameStop um, price. And so, you know, they discuss here a little bit of, you know, the background of, the, of GameStop and, you know, they conclude here, right, and we'll get into this later on in the paper, they conclude here that they have uh, found evidence of GameStop FTDs creating consistent cycles up to one year in our data in the T plus 35 FTD clearing period and less consistent but repeating cycles between T plus 3 and T plus 6. And no other persistent cycles were found in other periods. Again, this is an older paper, so you know it's uh, they don't have data for 2024, unfortunately. Um, but some of the key points to notice is, right, there's 93 ETFs with exposure to GameStop Corp, and more than 18% of examined ETFs form uh, cycles and patterns between a number of FTDs and stock prices for around 35 days after delaying delivery of the shares. And, um, you know, the other, I guess, interesting point here, right, is the, uh, is a couple of the points they make um, later on, which is essentially, that these ETFs, and they hypothesize this, right? These ETFs are being used as a way for naked shorts to kick the can on their own FTDs without having to cover. And they'll, they'll say that right here, right? So I'll, I'll start reading here. Um, or actually maybe even here. 
According to Evans, this is another paper, there could be scope for market makers to make a predictable return if there's belief that the net asset value of the ETF underlying securities will decrease in the following day. To do so, an, uh, an AP can redeem ETF shares and delay, delay creation around the standard T plus 3 settlement. If the ETF is an open-end fund, it can issue or redeem the amount of outstanding shares which means that the bid of ETF shares is unlimited if there's an ask, and this process can generate FTDs. Despite this process, FTDs can occur for several reasons. The most cited ones are human error, administrative delay, or bona fide activities. Bona fide means in good faith. Stratman and Webb Wellburn states that ETFs are popular vehicles for hedging market index movements, and ETF short interest often exceeds shares outstanding. This The study shows several findings. The first is a positive relationship between the ETF daily short sales volume and ETF FTDs. And I'll zoom in a little further if you can see this. Second, ETF FTDs increase as stock borrow costs rise and indicate short sellers' intention to avoid borrowing costs. Third, ETF FTDs contribute to market volatility. And lastly, ETF FTDs increase with put option open interest, right? FTDs are also associated with naked short selling the term, okay, we already know that, um, what what a naked short selling actually is. Um, blah, 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 blah. Um, and basically what, they, what they're saying here, right, is these, these ETF, um, you know, the boom in ETFs has allowed a new way for, for institutions to skirt regulations around failure to deliver. And, you know, this, the increase in, in FTDs um, with an ETF doesn't mean the same thing legally as an increase in FTDs in a typical stock, right? Because you can basically use the ETF to create a synthetic short position. And, you know, you can even use the ETF in a basket swap, which, which I've talked about before and which, you know, Richard Newton has covered. But this is kind of, you know, this is really fascinating, right? Because if we look at um, XRT, which is the main ETF that they're using this for right they're using to short um you know most of the volume is short volume and it's mostly off exchange right and the short interest is 20 million shares now xrt has an authorized um or at least you know a, a, a an authorized share count of 20 million shares uh, or sorry, 5.7 million shares, and they have short interest of 20. And so right now, that's you know 400 or so percent short interest. And the borrow fee rates, you know, have remained positive this entire time, as you know, as we've we've seen the GameStop runoff with some spikes on key dates where uh, the GameStop price was exceptionally high. And as I'll go on, you know, in further detail later in this video, we will see. The FTD spikes in XRT line up basically exactly T plus three around spikes in GameStop's price. It's really interesting. It's really, really interesting. So let's go back to this. Okay. So, um, you know, they're able to, you know, using these ETFs, right? They're able to basically delay, you know, delay, uh, they're able to create a share and then delay delivery for 35 days. And the market maker who can, you know, issue the underlying shares, they have another way of, of you know, quote unquote, uh, kicking the can is the market maker can deliver synthetic share to the AP. And so the market maker can naked short extra shares and create synthetics and give those synthetics to the AP who back it, package them into an ETF and sells the whole ETF. And so your ETF that you might be buying may not have all real shares. It may have a large percentage of synthetic shares and you won't know because of the opacity within the financial markets, right? Um, and, you know, they also cover, you know, uh, the squeeze and gamma ramps and, you know, options and I, I don't really want to get into this, um, you know, super deep um, because, again, we, we can do another video on options. But what's really interesting here um, is, you know, their conclusions. First of all, despite the rules, FTDs are expected to occur, are expected to occur randomly and any systematic 
patterns of FTDs in stock markets do not comply with regulation show. If it does not happen randomly or by accident, there could be a possibility that FTDs have been created systematically, which has implications for the market. And so essentially saying, you know, the these FTDs are indicative of naked short selling, widespread naked short selling within the market. And again, I won't go into all this like math. They, they, they discuss like a lot of the, uh, you know, technical jargon behind, you know, how they found wavelet co coherence. They talk about the story of the GameStop squeeze. I don't need to cover all that. They show the chart. But here are their ETFs. Okay, so they select, you know, what is this? A little over a dozen ETFs that all include GameStop, right? And their allocation to GME. And XRT, you can see here, 0.71% uh, allocation. And the largest one is this Vanguard small cap value ETF at, you know, 0.2%. Um, and their wavelet coherence charts can be found here. Now, these are pretty um, pretty confusing to, to understand, right? But, but here's the main thing you need to notice, okay? This bottom part is the month and the time period. So about right in the middle is 2021 January. So 2021 month three, it would be right here. And 2021 month one would be, you know, right around here. And so, and, and then this is the periods in days from, you know, the, you know, the FTD closeout to the price rising. And this, the hotter the, um, you know, the red line is the hotter the correlation, the more correlated it is. As you can see here, right, these these streaks that move downwards, that is an example that is uh, evidence of an FTD occurring and then it being kick the can, kick the can, and then the price rising. And so here you can see here January twenty twenty one, FTDs starting at T plus six and then continuing through T plus eight, T plus sixteen, look on the left here. And then all the way to T plus 32, 34, 35, right around here with massive, you know, price action on these T plus 35 dates. And you can see this still happening here in August of 2021. All these T plus 35, this is happening in April, May, June, right? It's even happening here again, extremely high correlation in December of 2021. And this is VBR. So this is an ETF. So... This hap has happened with, look at this ETF, IJJ, VIOO, I believe that's the Vanguard one. Um, you see the correlation with XI, with VONE, -E, SFY, this one is less correlated, SFYX. Um, and down here is XRT. Okay. So XRT basically has this huge long spike in GME. FTDs correlating with the stock price for all of, you know, this is basically like what month? This is October 2020 all the way to March of 2021 and then continued smaller spikes over here. And again, I should note, right, this is a correlation index, right? So correlation of one means basically perfectly correlated. In finance, almost nothing is perfectly correlated. And so for these to be red, this red in 0.8 or higher is extremely uncommon. And it shows that this, you know, th these failure to delivers weren't necessarily just, um, you know, random. They weren't occurring irregardless of GameStop price. They're, the spikes in FTDs were occurring coincident with GameStop price rises, showing, you know, definitively that this run-up in 2021, the January 2021 20, run-up, as well as the February 24th, 2021 run up and March and April and May and June and all the different different spikes we had all along this journey, right? If we go back, all these spikes, this isn't retail at all and, and it isn't short covering. These are FTD forced buy-ins. Here, 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 even here, 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 all these spikes. This T plus 35 cycle that keeps repeating is from these forced buy-ins, right? And this is correlated on almost every single ETF. Again, some of these ETFs obviously have higher, much higher correlation than others. This one seems barely correlated. This one seems barely correlated only for, you know, T plus 32, 34 right here um, for just a couple months and then it falls off. But, you know, some of these, like, look at this. This one lasted for 
you know, a year, over a year, right? And, th and their data set only goes until December 2021, right? 2021, month 12. So I find this really interesting because, again, you can see which ETFs have higher and higher, you know, correlation uh, with the, and their FTDs correlate to, um, to the GameStop price. And you can see here, this is the summary of all of them, right? All the selected uh, ETFs to the James GameStop price, and especially from uh, December of, or I'd say October of 2020, all the way to March, April, this is probably April of 2021, very high correlation. And, you know, these other small pockets also show correlation of, uh, you know, massive correlation between the FTDs, spikes in FTDs and the GameStop price. And so, you know, they kind of confirm here that they found the, you know, they found a, a strong correlation between these FTD cycles and the T plus 35 cycle and the GameStop price. And so, you know, basically this, this reveals, right, um, these systematic <laughs> failures delivered do not comply with the reg show. And the question, you know, the question is raised, right, like, are these unique exemptions purely used for bona fide good faith market making activities or are they abused for the intention of investors benefiting from delaying settlement? And, you know, they say this other paper points to reasons why increased short selling can lead to more FTDs. However, these reasons should not lead to long lasting cycles as we have been identified in the case of GameStop. Significant co-movements were identified between GME returns and 16 ETFs. Significant cycles were also identified between T plus 3 and T plus 6. The results are very similar among ETFs focused on specific market capitalization, but also among ETFs invested in the whole market. Robustness analysis um, by aggregating these ETF FTDs provides very similar results and supports our findings. And so these and, and these co-movements occur during these important delivery periods, right? And, you know, this is kind of confirmed by what Turdferg had po posted. This was over a year ago. Again, I, I'll link this in the description below if you want to go read it. Um, but he talks about, right, the general, um, you know, the general cycle of the ETF FTDs and how the market makers are able to use, um, you know, the bona fide market maker and bona fide authorized participant um, exemptions to create FTDs and kick the can down the road. And, you know, you can see here for BlackRock's iShares, uh, the biggest APs are Merrill Lynch, Goldman Sachs, and Citadel, all right? And Vanguard's are Virtu, J.P. Morgan, and Citigroup. And State Street is Merrill Lynch, Virtu, and Citadel. So Citadel, Virtu, all the main market makers are here all throughout this case. And here he talks about the um, same arbitrage process, the NAV-based order process. Again, we've already gone over that. Um, you know, here's also the interesting, you know, heartbeat of the market, as it's called, the wash trades that continue, like, at these huge volume spikes. You can see, you know, them using the ETFs uh, to redeem shares and or to, to get shares, right? These are massive spikes in, in volume. And, and to get, to get um, or sorry, not redeem, to create shares. These are fund flows into the, the ETF, so they're putting money in getting ETF shares out, and then they can potentially use those ETF shares, right, um, as a bona fide uh, borrow, right, on the underlying shares. And so, you know, here he talks about, like, the, the vertical put spreads and, the, you know, the pairing of, you know, these puts with the stock price as well as with, you know, the ETF uh, volumes. And what's really interesting is, and I'll blow this up here, right, so here's his um, data for this is January 2021. So you can see here's the price run up, and I'll I'll put the top of it here so you can see. Here's the GME price, the XRT net asset value, the XRT implied volatility 30 day running. You can see here the IV just fucking goes to the roof here in in uh, January, right? In, on the 27th, 28th, and 29th of January. Um, and the flows, $452 million pulled out and $54 million pulled out the next day um, of XRT. And, you know, ostensibly, right, this 
this is basically redemption of uh, ETF shares to get the underlying. They were trying to get an extremely hard to borrow stock, aka GME, and understand you know what exactly was happening with um, you know basically be able to cover to kick the can on on their shorts right on their FTDs. And what's interesting here is you can see the FTDs right. Remember T plus three to T plus six after these extreme this extreme high volume day. The FTD spikes to 2.2 million um, FTDs and 1.3 and 1.5. And you can see here, you know, the 216,000. It, it starts to peter off after this. Uh, but these three days after the, the GameStop runoff and after this, this right here is the 28th. Yep, this is the 28th where they have a lower uh, FTD day because obviously the buy button was shut off. But in the three days afterwards, massive amounts of FTDs on the on the uh, ETF itself. And this equates to, right, a huge amount of, of the percent of their shares outstanding, right? And the open interest and, you know, the IV had exploded, right? We're seeing before here, like, there's 23,000, you know, options open interest. Now there's 100,000, 68,000 for, for the better course of February they're, they're using. Um, you know, the options as a, as a way to gain access to the ETF shares. And a lot of this is in puts, right? You can see here, just huge amount of puts. Um, I mean, look, look at these numbers. Like the calls were 100,000, but the puts were 400,000, 476,000, 432,000. They were using these deep out of the money puts um, basically as a way to, you know, get a, uh, a secured, you know, collateral, um, or, or I would say, it's a secured way to to waive a part of a margin requirement, and that's been confirmed by um, I don't know if he posed this in this piece right here, but I've seen there's a former um, a former market maker, a trader who worked for market making desk, saying that the out of the money puts, I believe it was in a Creon DD, uh, the out of the money puts um, are used to waive uh, a portion of the margin requirement on a posi on a derivative position um, because it, it allows them, you know, to say, okay, well, the counterparty has all these shares. Now they have a right to sell at this price, right? This can kick the – this can satisfy the obligation. And what's really interesting, right, is like this discrepancy is, is widely used because of different – um, you know, settlement periods for these different products, okay? So as, you know, Turd has pointed out, um, you know, the vast majority of funds are settled T plus one, but a lot of, you know, uh, so mutual funds settled T plus one, but retail investors, equities, and ETFs settled T plus three, which allows a, you know, a delayed period for, you know, the market maker, the, the AP, who else, to... Find the shares and then to you know create this synthetic naked short position and then eventually to kick that can down the road when when they need to. Um, and you know the options and the pairing of the options with the uh, ETF is a is a is a lethal combination that they can use to continually naked short the company um, and kick the can down the road and not have to for face closeout obligations. And like we said, you know. XRT currently, right, this is 618, so this is a few days old, 64% short volume ratio. On some days, it's at 87, right, it's 75%. I mean, it's always in excess of 50%. But here are, okay, so here's the fail to deliver data. It's a little delayed, and I also have it in format here if you want to look at it. Um, and I want to see if there's, okay. So the fail to deliver data, right, we can see it. It's it's only for last month. Um, there's these massive spikes in FTDs on certain trading days. And so if you look, like for example here, 5.9 and 5.10, huge spikes in FTDs. 5.28, another massive spike in FTDs. And we don't have, unfortunately, data for this month. But if you look at this last month of trading, if we can change here. So here is, right, last month's little run up. We had a huge spike of FTDs here, right? So let's see, it's 5, 
10, right? 5, 9, 5, 10. So in the two days before the price runs up, there are FTDs, a mass amount of FTDs. So here, this is uh, 5, 9, so May, May 9th and May 10th, right here, these two trading days. So these two trading days, right here, the 9th and the 10th, right before Roaring Kitty returns, mass spikes in FTDs in the XRT ETF. And three trading days later, so Tuesday, May 24th, the 14th, we see a huge spike in GameStop price, and then another spike on Wednesday. Again, all this blamed on Roaring Kitty, all this blamed on him coming back, but it aligns with the T plus three and T plus six, right? As you can see, the, the price remains elevated for the rest of this week until this Friday, which is when GameStop uh, announced their first 45 million share um, you know, sale. Um, this huge spike, oh, where is it? Here it is. Um, this huge spike coincides in FTDs, three days later coincides with a run up in the GME price. And let's look again, let's test this hypothesis again at uh, 528, okay? So you can see this five. So May twenty eighth, again, which is another. What's really interesting is this was one of the large swap rollover dates. So the three swaps rolling over in May were May. It was May fourteenth. Yeah, it's May fourteenth. It was May twenty eighth, and then May thirtieth, or thirty first. Actually, I think it was the thirty first. But anyways, the twenty eighth was a large swap rollover date. And if you look at five twenty eight on the chart, let's. Get over here. Here is, okay. Here's the 24th, and then here's the Tuesday the 28th. So from Friday the 24th to Tuesday the 28th, right here, you can see at the bottom, the price runs up to $26. And then it collapses back down, stays flat, and then T plus six trading days later, Monday the 3rd, the price goes absolutely parabolic and makes this little jump look like fucking nothing. Again, exactly time with DFV's tweets and exactly time with um, swap rollovers. And so whoever was, you know, for, for whatever reason, these spikes in FTDs and XRT itself are aligning with massive increases in the price, almost exactly delayed T plus 3 to T, between T plus 3 to T plus 6 after the FTDs are, um, are recorded. Okay, so that's basically the theory, right? And the other interesting wrinkle that I want to throw in here is this. Okay, um, in 2017, there was a lawsuit, right, filed against, um, filed by this uh, this company, you know, or sorry, not a lawsuit, it was a request for no action relief, fired by this broker dealer that wanted to say, like, look, we're we're market maker or broker dealer, um, and we are you know mainly trading exchange traded, traded products, and we want to ensure, uh, you know, request assurance that they will not recommend commission enforcement action under Rule 204 of Reg Show, under the Securities Exchange Act of 1934. If the firm, consistent with the approach described in the letter, closes out to fail to deliver in position the securities of certain exchange. Traded products by submitting no later than the beginning of regular trading hours and the applicable closeout date, irre irrevocable instructions to create shares in the covered ETF for which the firm has a closeout authorized authorized closeout obligation through an authorized participant, um, and they also seek confirmation that shares of a covered ETF purchased through the execution of a creation order or shares of a covered ETF sold through the execution of a redemption request submitted with the AP should be treated in the same manner of purchase or sales of the covered ETF in the secondary market. So essentially, you know, this this a request for no action relief, what it's basically saying is, um, and this was, you know, really clearly laid out by this lawyer who, who wrote on this blog, okay, um, is that th what they're asking for is that the ETF basically not be applicable to, or not have to deal with R Rule 204 of Rake Show. And Rule 204, requires the clearing broker dealers to close out the fail to deliver for short sales at the start of trading on the settlement day um, after the settlement date or for fail to deliver fail to deliver positions resulting from long sales or attributable to bona fide good faith market making activities by the start of the third settlement day t plus three after the settlement date the no action letter 
permits a firm to close out a fail to deliver position for ETF shares by submitting an irrevocable creation order directly to an authorized participant no later than the beginning of trading hours on the applicable close out date. So what does this mean? Guys, this is the key right here. This is it. If they have an FTD, they're telling you in plain English, if they have an FTD, they can close it out by submitting an irrevocable creation order to the a to the authorized participant. So again, you're short GME, you have an FTD, you have to you have to, you know, close out this uh, this this share that you've sold synthetically short and you don't have the share. You can close out that FTD if you go to an authorized participant and you say, "Hey, I'm forcing you to make right uh, an ETF. I'm forcing you to make a basket of or, or, or an ETF share, which includes the basket of shares. And once you create that basket of shares in an ETF share and you hand me back the ETF share, that will satisfy my obligation for the FTD. That's what this means. As far as I understand it, again, I'm not a securities lawyer, but this seems very clear to me. And this is why the FTDs on the on XRT spike, they're probably getting a huge amount of requests, right? They're, they're getting a huge amount of requests um, for, you know, creation of ETF shares so that they can so that these broker dealers or that these short head funds or whoever can dodge um, a short <laughs> um, a short closeout obligation, an FTD, they're they're able to dodge it by going to the ETF, asking for you know, or forcing I shouldn't say asking, forcing a redemption request, a, a creation request, forcing an ETF share to be created, and the ETF is creating so many shares that they that even the ETF, the authorized participants, starts to FTD on their own shares. Right. They don't have all the underlying, they can't create it, and so they just create a synthetic and give it to you. But that kicks the can, or I should say, hands the potato to the next person. So instead of you as a short hedge fund having the FTD on your books, now the authorized participant has the FTD on their books. And it's very different for an authorized participant to have the FTD on their books because what this means is, you know, these ETFs aren't app aren't um you know subject to reg show in the same way that uh, an equity is right xrt has been like if you look at uh let's find uh oh, not that i want to touch on these other things really quick i need to i need to run soon too but i tweeted this earlier um okay i'll just go back to my it should be right here, right here. Okay. XRT, as you can see here, this is from one of Dave Lauer's videos. Here's the, this is the reg show threshold list. And, and this is the amount of days held onto it. XRT has been there for 1,652 days, 1,600 days. Now, if you use a date and time calculator, that brings us back to December of 2019. So well before any of this, you know, run up, that's when this ETF, the XRT ETF, began to be naked shorted into oblivion. And what's interesting here, right, is in order for uh, an either a, an ETF or an equity to be placed on the on the on this list, they need to have more than half percent of their float na uh, FTD in FTDs, meaning like the FTDs have to have to equal more than half percent of their entire you know float of of outstanding shares. And number two, they have to be on there for more than five consecutive trading days with the NSCC or the OCC. So it's not just three days, not just four days, five consecutive days. And once they go five consecutive days off, then they're off the list and then this resets. Okay. This means XRT hasn't been, there haven't been more than five consecutive days where XRT hasn't been naked shorted beyond half a percent of the float in four years almost right this is massive and you can look to here too right there's other etfs that have similar issues right the daily gold miners index bear etf you know there's some of these are chipotle lazy boy right um the spider oil and gas exploration etf 
Um, I think, you know, there was a uh, Krispy Kreme on here at one point, like a lot of American companies that we know and love, as well as just random ETFs that what, for whatever reason, the market makers don't like or don't want to, you know, support the, you know, price movement of get shorted into oblivion and get stuck on this list for years and years and years. And especially in the, in the, um, Especially in the case of ETFs, right? This has been able to be kicked down the can, the, or the can has been able to kick down the road so much longer, just because the ETFs are treated differently, right? This legal finding, you know, shows that there's an they can just close out this FTD for ETF shares by submitting this creation order, and the person who creates, right, the AP who who creates the ETF share, theoretically they have to own the underlying, but they may not. Right, or they may just own synthetic shares of the underlying. They may not own re real ones, but regardless, the ETF shares acts as uh, acts as uh, a closeout for that FTD. Now, what's been really interesting too has been seeing right these volume dates right around you know June se so June sixth, June seventh, right. This is T plus three from the prior um, you know. June third run up from Roaring Kitties, uh, his his second reemergence with his Uno reverse card, and you know this is something that Six Days has been pointing out, right? Like the DRS tally record date, um, we saw two hundred and seventy nine thousand, two hundred six thousand share volume, seventy three share volume, seventy three million share volume, right? Massive spikes in volume on these days, right around a DRS record date, even more than this one hundred sixty five. Uh, million share date, right? Huge, huge volume. And what also is interesting here is, so the CAT system, which was recently, you know, put into place, right? This is, uh, here's a little, you know, excerpt of, these are all the CAT. Um, this is the update for, for CAT, it's released today. Um, and you know, CAT came into effect earlier this month. Basically, it's the audit trail that that tracks all the trades in the market and tracks who makes them and how they make it. But the really interesting, you know, point here is if you look at some of these dates, right? Six oh six, six oh seven, right? Options. Look, look at six oh seven. One billion, and maybe I'll zoom in here. One billion uh, late trades for options and 1.1 billion errors. One billion, one hundred thirty-eight million, two hundred sixty-nine thousand. So a huge spike in errors on the 607 date, um, as well as smaller spikes in errors around here. Now then, then we go back to more of a normal three million, six million, four hundred fifty-one thousand. Right, errors in in options trades, but a massive spike in this just on the 7th of, of June, which is just, you know, two weeks ago, earlier this month. And like I said, all of this coincides with um, the, you know, price run up. Here we can see this is June 6th. So this is when, you know, the price, the gamma ramp was building. DFV had his, um, was preparing for his live stream, right? And they, you know, issue 75 million shares over, you know what two you know two or three trading days they they stop it around here um all these errors happen right around here and once we see the ftd data for for june we'll be able to confirm but i have a a, a sneaking suspicion that there will be a massive spike of ftds right around here because as this gamma ramp built up and all as these market makers were getting caught with their pants down they were probably naked shorting to the moon, right? They're making shorting as many shares as they could, and then they were trying to get out, and they were using the ETFs as um, a vehicle to satisfy their FTDs, and now then the FTDs would move on to the ETF, right? So these these spikes in FTDs right here, you can see fail to deliver volume, the spike in, in FTD volume, where, you know, we see half a million shares FTD here, um, right? Huge amount of shares. Um, we should probably see that similarly around, you know, mid June as this price would, uh, would, would indicate. Okay. That's basically all for today. Um, 
again, I wanted to point out like uh, there's this huge, you know, we still have this huge gamma ramp building. Um, so tomorrow will be spicy. There's 112,000 uh, call options at the 125 strike. So, um, you know, that is clearly an institution. I had an interview with Dario and the interview is going to be put out hopefully tonight, maybe tomorrow morning um, on my Substack. Uh, it's a podcast interview, but he basically points out, and I think he's accurate, he's right, that this war is not just between retail and, you know, short institutions, that there are long institutions on the side of GameStop who are trying to squeeze the shorts and make money in the process of that. And so what they're doing is they're using, you know, like 112,000 open interest on this position. This isn't retail. Right, retail follows normally a normal distribution. They mostly, you know, trade near the money or slightly out of the money call options. A position this size, 112,000. This is almost as big as DFE's initial position. This is an uh, an institution building um, a call a call wall at 125. And I'm not sure exactly what they expect because it's unlikely that we're going to go to 125 within a couple trading days. Right, this would be tomorrow. Today's June 20th. Um, but if it does happen, that would be incredible. If you want to learn more and see more about the Gamma Ramp, you can watch this video right here. I'll put it down uh, in the video. And other than that, thanks everybody and have a good night.